vacation time away, so I'm going to give you an abbreviated version unless you just want to stay before the 11 o'clock service. And, and No? Oh, you don't see a lot of excitement about that. Praise God. <laughs> we are going to continue in our Lenten uh, series uh, where we are, of course, for the, the six weeks leading up to Resurrection Sunday, uh, really wrestling with what does it mean, of course, to be uh, faithful uh, to this journey as Jesus was making to uh, Calvary and certainly to Resurrection Sunday, that all of us, particularly in uh, the Christian church, uh, many across the world are, are deeply wrestling with what and how does uh, our life and our journey resonate with Jesus' journey to Calvary. How many of you know that uh, Paul often said that uh, in, 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 in uh, the, the, the Pauline letters that uh, I, I must die, parts of me must die, I must die to my flesh or myself daily. And uh, I, I, I am always holding on to this reality that for as much as we want uh, God to change the world, God is saying, I'm trying to change you. And if I change you, you may in turn help change and transform the world. And so uh, we're going to spend a few moments uh, speaking on this passage and imagining what does it mean for us as we go into this journey. The book of Luke, as you know, uh, is the most uh, inclusive and universal gospel written, and so you find all kinds of important and wonderful expressions of <coughs> our faith. Luke chapter number 13, uh, the words of scripture, they say, and then some Pharisees came to Jesus and said, run for your life. Herod is on the hunt. If you don't know who Herod is, Herod is the king. He is the Donald Trump of his day. Amen. He's on the hunt. And he's out to kill you. Jesus said, tell that fox that I've no time for him right now. Man, Jesus wasn't scared of nobody. Amen. He was like, you, know, he tell the, you tell Donald Trump, I mean, you tell uh, Herod, amen. Uh, you know, old fox, I'm not, I, I ain't got time for this right now. That could be the sermon all right there. Amen. I ain't got no time for this right now. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I ain't got no time for this today. Amen. You be careful. But that's not what I'm, I'm preaching for Lent, amen. That, that's a non Lenten sermon. But you can pack it away in your back pocket, Brother James. You tell him I ain't got no time for this today. Why? Because today and tomorrow I'm busy clearing out demons and healing the sick. The third day I'm wrapping things up. Besides, it's not proper for a prophet to come to a bad ending outside Jerusalem. Man, we're going to unpack that. That's not a compliment for Jerusalem. <laughs> Amen. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killer of prophets, abuser of the messengers of God. How often I've longed to gather your children, gather your children like a hen, her brood safe under her wings. But you refused and turned away. Look now, your house is abandoned and empty. You won't see me again until the day you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of God. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about uh, reckless abandon. I, 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 I uh, was, was almost going to title this message, uh, uh, what was I going to call this message? Oh, foxes, hens, and demons. But I decided just to make those my points, praise God. Amen. So bow your heads with me as we pray. God, we ask you to bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word in Jesus' name. We pray, let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, for those of us who will follow the ways of Jesus faithfully, we will always live in a tension. The tension of the world as it is, as we experience it, as it is in reality, versus the way the world should be. 
And you can have in your imagination for this sermon the world in all of its different kind of manifestations. You know, the, the international world, the our national world, the world on your job, the world in your family, dare I even say the world within yourself. The world as it is versus the world as it should be. And the wrestling of how can we know that there is a truth of scripture that reminds us that when God created everything, dare I say, when God creates, God creates everything good. There is no deficiency in what God creates. God created the world, it was good. When God created you, it was good. None of us are being created with a uh, uh, inherent bad or evilness attributed to us. But somehow these things can, from the external environment, be imposed upon us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, theologian I, I, I refer to uh, very frequently in his, uh, one of his, his theological, uh, systematic theological books, uh, Simon Chan, he says that there are three types of sin in the world. I'm talking about that which can be introduced or imposed upon us. The sin within us, this is our flesh, the sin around us, that is the kind of uh, social, systemic stuff that we got to contend with. And then the sin beyond us. And that is the devil and all the devil's business. Amen. Now, too often we will spend more time focusing on the devil we can't see. Rather than attending to the devil, the, the systems, the structures, the sin that we are easily beset by every day. As we go through this season of Lent, I want you to appreciate that the last weeks of Jesus' life forced him to confront all of these sins. He had to confront the, the evil and the flesh, the inclinations of his own heart that did not want him to fulfill God's call. Because if you remember, Jesus gets into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is like, all right, uh, you really want me to do this, huh? There's got to be another way to save these folk. Amen. Because, you know, th 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 this, th this, this cross is a real thing. Amen. Jesus understood that even though he knew he had a mission, there was a part of him that was struggling to go the other way. How many ever had that struggle inside you before, right? Oh, I, I know I'm clear about my mission. I'm not, I'm not here questioning what I'm called to do. But there's a part of me that is not willing to cooperate. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, Jesus had to deal with the sin around him. All these soldiers and the injustice of the Roman Empire, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus realized, all right, I got my own internal struggle, but there's also the struggle of these folk out here who's supposed to be my support, my friend, my comrades. Or I'm clear that they my enemy, they my antagonist, they my obstacle. And regardless of who they are, they are trying to pull me away from what I'm called to do. And then Jesus was definitely aware of the devil because he met the devil in the, in the desert. Amen. Amen. Jesus was like, oh, yeah, I, I'm familiar with you. I, I, I cast you out of heaven some eons ago. Now you're down here walking around still trying to deceive folk. But Jesus didn't do too much arguing with the devil. He just told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. That's all you should tell the devil. Whenever the devil comes knocking on your door, don't be arguing with the devil. Even if it's the devil and some people. Somebody say amen. 
I be in meetings, I be telling them, devil, you full of the devil, but it's okay. Because I already got the devil under my feet. Now, you be careful, because, you know, I want to distinguish between you and the devil. I may have to put you under my feet with the devil. Somebody say amen, right? But we know that there are all of these realities within us, around us, beyond us, that are the things that create the tension between the world we know God wants and the world we are forced to contend in every day. I want you to know, child of God, that too often the tension will create recklessness in us and lead to us abandoning our purpose, our call, and our position. And have us, as uh, the gospel according to uh, TLC says, looking for waterfalls, chasing waterfalls, rather than sticking to the rivers and the lakes that you must be used to. Somebody say amen. As we go through Lent, I want you, child of God, to allow this season of reflection and prayerfully some of us are making some decisions about how we spend our time. That as I pray and as I sacrifice, as I watch less uh, foolishness on TV, I, I've come off Facebook, amen. I took it off my phone and my, I'm so addicted to Facebook that it's not even on my phone and I be opening my phone to go to it and I don't even remember, I took it off. Man, I dare you to take some of that stuff off your phone and watch your thumbs just be, be, be frantically looking for it. But the time that I now don't spend on Facebook, I'm able to spend in self-reflection and prayer and reading, trying to figure out how this sin within, around, and beyond is attempting to easily take me off my position, out of my place. And if we are not clear about the many ways that the enemy is seeking to push you off your post, we will recklessly be an accomplice to the enemy's plan. And let's look at a few ways, amen, amen, this is just the abbreviated version, uh, of, of, of the ways that I think you and I can unwittingly be accomplices to the enemy's plan. Here in the text, you obviously see Jesus speaking in a very powerful way, coming out of a kind of place where Jesus knows that I have some disciples, that I have uh, extended invitations to, and they have decided to follow me. Now, there are many who Jesus extended invitations to, and there were many who came to Jesus uh, just based off of what they saw Jesus doing. And when Jesus started to ask of them certain things, the scripture says many of them said that the ways and the sayings of Jesus is just too hard. Folk walked away. It's all right, no, I, Jesus, I want to follow you. What do I have to do? Jesus would always hit them. Give everything you have up. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, I'm trying to follow you now. I mean, well, how are we starting with every with, with the thing that I, what can I follow you with a few things? No, they walk away. I think it was Ben last week that talked about, or somebody recently talked about the woman caught in adultery and 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 all these so-called religious folk coming to Jesus, and Jesus says, cast the first stone that they and they had to what? Walk away. There's a whole lot of folk who claim to want to follow God, but when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the request is made, mm, we shake our head, drop whatever we have, and walk away. Well, I think there are a lot of things that we must contend with today that are getting in the way of us following Jesus. The first thing that I'll lift up certainly is we have to be conscious of empire and foxes. Somebody say empire, empire and foxes. Now it's clear in the biblical text that Herod is a representative of the empire. And even still today, you and I have 
the empire of our government and, dare I say, the fallen systems of this world that are always inviting us into participating with their plans. As we watch with horror this terrible, terrible uh, act of violence in New Zealand, it was so interesting watching the response of both my Muslim friends and the leaders in New Zealand because when this kind of violence crops up in places that people don't expect, their first response is, number one, this does not happen here. And I always ask myself, how do we define here? Because as followers of Jesus, the whole earth is our responsibility to steward. There is no here. There is just God's creation. And part of our challenge living in a empire, a, 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 a philosophy of empire, is that we will carve up the world in ways that make us believe we don't belong to one another, nor do we have the responsibility to ensure that here is there and there is here. It does not take away from the deep tragedy of the white supremacists, the Christo-fascists, if you will, who continue to use sacred texts, biblical texts, as an instrument to weaponize their most deadly demonic impulses, which makes me continue to have to think about if the empire causes us to abandon our post, so do the foxes. In the text, Herod is the fox, according to Jesus. Now, I'm not calling nobody out your name. Jesus is. Somebody say amen. 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 Tell your neighbor, don't you be no fox today. Amen. Don't you act in ways that make Jesus call you out your name. How many of you know that sometimes our complicity with empire will make us act very different than who God created us to be? One could argue that as a steward of the earth, you need political leaders. Because it's just a system. Our church, as it's structured, is a system. Structure is not the enemy of God's will. But when you become a steward of a system and are pushed off of your divine post and place, you can become an agent of evil. And that's what Jesus is saying in this text. Herod, you are a fox. Because you are attempting to kill what God has created. White supremacy is a fox. Imperialism. You know what imperialism is? The idea that we should be in everybody else's country with armies and weapons, fighting wars and destroying and killing citizens and, and children under the guise of making America great again. Or manifest destiny was the philosophy used to wipe out all these folk. The Ohlone land where we have in worship at. Somebody used a theological principle that they created to help define stewardship as an act of taking that which God Created as a gift. I always ask people who are like, you know, these real kind of, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, violence driven folk. You know, they think they got to fight for God. <laughs> like, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. You know, that's a metaphor, right? Amen. <laughs> so I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm going to go get my, my, my what's, what's them big old guns? And I'm going to get that M. M something, M16, and I'm going to have a grenade launcher, and I'm going to have Kevlar vest on, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm like, God don't need you to fight his battles. <laughs> Jesus said, listen, 
Because, you know, the disciples got caught up in that. Jesus, we ready to go. Jesus, Jesus said, listen now, if I needed some backup, <laughs> I would not be calling you. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> you, you ain't, if I needed some backup, I'd call a whole host of heaven. Matter of fact, I'm keeping Michael and Gabriel and them from coming down, blowing up this joint. Somebody say amen. So I'm not... Believe me now, I don't need you to pick up a sword or a gun. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of human origin. We defeat hate with love. We defeat violence with peace. We defeat hell with heaven. Put your, put your guns away. But too many of us get power and we want to be like the children of Israel. And, you know, they saw their friends with kings. They're like, I want a king. I want a king I can see. I want a queen I can put my hands on. I can go pay tribute to. So the prophet told him, all right, you get what you want now. But I'm going to tell you, that king or that queen going to ask for your children. Because every king and a queen needs an army. And kings and queens don't have enough kids to fight in no army. So guess who the king and the queens going to fill their armies with? Your children. My children. That's why this whole thing about the testing was so diabolical this week. Because we see that this empire will still reward the privileged and the wealthy who already have a leg up on so many. And make the rest of us feel like we just out here not trying hard enough. Man, I tell my young people all the time, you're going to have to be better. You're going to have to be faster. You're going to have to be more responsible. You know, we're asking most of us to be superhuman. And then we wonder why our bodies and our mind and our spirit crumble under the pressure. God did not create you to be superhuman. God created you to be filled with the power of God so you can do the supernatural. But you're still a human being. You're going to have to get you eight hours of sleep. Somebody say amen. You're going to have to get you some exercise. Somebody say amen. You have to find you somebody to love and them to love you. Somebody say amen. You're going to have to find you a church, a community that will remember your name. Somebody say amen. You're going to have to get up and go to work now, though. Somebody say amen. But sometimes the work may be on your mind, so you got to go to a therapist. Or it may be on your body, so you got to go to the doctor. Or it may be you just taking a vacation day to take care of yourself. But child of God, you are a human being. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, Lord, I feel like preaching, but I ain't even in my notes. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them reckless abandon. Uh, you better not allow anybody to recklessly push you off your post. Whew. When God has given you a clear mission. And the season of Lent is to help you get refocused on your mission. Oh, what's the first question? Go, 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 go. What, what's, what's the question I need to ask? Are you more aligned with the work of empire? Versus the work of the kingdom or the kingdom. Some of us spend more time working for the man than we do working for God's purpose. You can work for the man, but just make sure wherever you are, you know that I, I, I'm here building the kingdom, the kingdom of God, wherever I am. Don't you get so caught up on where your paycheck comes from that you forget you got a full-time, people tell me I'm unemployed, I said a child of God is never unemployed. You always got a job to do. And your job is to build up the kingdom or the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? It means you got to practice loving folk who you know. How I many know that's a full-time job? <laughs> this ain't that Al Green kind of love. Somebody say amen. I'm talking about a love that, 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 that that's a full-time job. I'm talking about the love that, that makes you have to work at it. This is the kind of full-time work on the behalf of the kingdom that you must do even on your job in your university. 
But there's some foxes that are trying to get you off your post. And what are those foxes? Who are the Herods in your life that are trying to use anger, fear, and pain to push you off your post? As we go through the Lent season, you got to ask yourself, Lord, I know you had to make your journey to the cross. Knowing that resurrection was possible. So God, how do I keep pushing on my journey? I may make a few mistakes, but your grace is sufficient for me. I may fall down a little bit, but the righteous person falls but gets up every time. I may not know how I may make it through the valley or make it through the flood or make it through the fire, but I know the God that brought me to it will also bring me through it. And greater is the God in me than the God that's in the world. Don't you be reckless and abandon your post. Go, 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 go to the next slide and the next slide. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end with this, this last one because I love how the scripture says that God is like a hen who wants to gather God's children. Put the children under the wings of a hen. If I had more time, I, I, I would invoke some of my friends who's doing all this great work on the, the feminine side of God, the images used in scripture that, that help deconstruct the over-masculinity nature attributed to God. Because how many of you know and are reminded that God is not a man? Like male. God is a spirit. So every description of God in scripture is there to help unlock a truth about what kind of balance we need in our life to be whole. So when scripture says God is like a hen who wants to gather chicks, I, 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 I don't got time to, 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 to go into this rabbit hole like I want to, but, but I, I, I was reading a, 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 a commentary about, about how hens use certain sounds. And the sounds that they use, the chick's ears are trained to the sound. That when there is an emergency, a certain sound will be made by the hen and the chicks will come running so they can find themselves under the wings of safety and security. When, when, when it's time to eat, the hen will make a sound. And the, 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 the chicks would run and find themselves ready to receive what they need to be sustained. Think about that truth. Because, you know, if you're like me, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my, my father's son, praise God. <laughs> and I thank God for my father at 60-something years old, 70-something he said, don't cheat me now, son. But I remember my father at 30-something and 40-something. Amen. And it was a, it was a, it was a one-speed daddy. Somebody say amen. amen. The walls quaked. And I, that's how I knew about the voice of God, because it was thunder. <laughs> but then my mom, honey, oh, honey. It's good balance. I thank God for this imagery in the text that helps remind us that God is not just about the thunder, but God is also about the tender calling of those who are in need of protection, healing, and sustenance. Could it be today, child of God, that this journey we are on in the midst of all this wickedness, you need to be reminded that God has not abandoned you. So don't you be reckless and abandon God. Don't allow the recklessness of this world to push you out of the arms of God and into the arms of your enemy. 
human hierarchy is your enemy. Exploitation is your enemy. Working 60, 70 hours a week till you can't function is your enemy. The sin within us, the sin beyond us, the sin around us. These are all things we must overcome if we are going to meet God at a place of resurrection. Come on, stand with me, everyone, and I invite you to grab the hand of someone next to you. God, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying right now for the loved one who I am touching today. Lord, you know their circumstance and their struggle. You know the challenges, the sin that so easily distracts them and knocks them off course. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would break through all of these barriers that are getting in the way of them realizing your power and your strength. I pray, God, that they will continue to be conscious of your presence. I pray, God, that as I gently squeeze their hand, that, God, you will give them peace. And may this touching, Lord God, of their hand help them to know that you are near them, that they are not alone, that there is power within their reach. There is healing. There is hope. There is strength. Help them to know and help them to see, God, that the enemy is already a defeated foe. For we are more than conquerors, more than victors. Through you who loved us and called us. Just like a hen seeks to gather her chicks. God, you are seeking to gather us. So gather my brother, gather my sister, gather my loved one. Gather my friend. Bring them into the safety and security of your life.